Morning, my microphone. I will not think. I'm teasing. I will go. I will, I'll even try it without goggles. Living on the edge. Hey, it is good to, uh, good to look out and see all of you this morning. For those joining online this morning, we are so glad that you are here with us. Hope that you can sense the presence of the Lord in your place, wherever you're watching, like we sense him present here. It's good to be in the Lord's house. Before we do anything else, I'm going to ask the ushers if they would come. We are going to receive an offering this morning for some of our missionaries, heroes uh, of, this, of this church, of this house. This is uh, for Jeremy and Tina Skinner. Some of you may not know them. I don't know if we have their picture up on the screen. I don't know if it got up there or not. But uh, oh, there we go with music. This is Jeremy and Tina. Tina, this is her church. She grew up here. Lori Dash is her mom. Jordan Henry is her brother. Heidi Van Cleve is her, is, is, is her sister. Uh, their whole family is part of our church. They, in Indonesia, their church that they were renting, the place, the space that they were meeting, they had to move. They were going to do something else with the building. At last notice, they had to find another place, do some renovations, uh, some furnishings, and they are $5,200 short, and we as a church want to cover that for them. And so we want to give you the opportunity to give, and if it's more than that, we're going to give it all to them because there is a lot of ministry that that they can do, and they're great missionaries. So uh, whether you've got a five, a 10, you want to write a check for a thousand, it all good. This is all going to the Skinners. They are, they are our missionaries, our family. We want to bless them. Father, I pray your blessing on this offering and on Jeremy and Tina and their family, their ministry, their family. God, would you just pour your spirit out on them and through them? Thank you for this opportunity that we can come alongside our family, our missionaries in this part of the world uh, to help them do and accomplish what you want to do in this part of the world. We pray your blessings in Jesus' name. Thank you for the privilege that we have to be part. Amen. Amen. Just pass those. We're not used to passing bags often anymore. Uh, giving typically goes in the boxes or you do that online, but we thought just last minute spring an offering on you. This is how we'll do it. And uh, so thank you for participating in that with us this morning. You heard that Sheepgate is going to be at the, uh, at the Fam Jam next week doing coffee. That is Teen Challenge. They've changed their name. Uh, here in Colfax, and uh, they are, the Hunsburgers are part of our church, and uh, we, we are excited for them to be here. I hope that you make it a point to come. Last year, we announced an off, uh, a, uh, a picnic on like the Sunday evening before the 4th of July. We were expecting like 150 people, and there was maybe five or 600 people, so uh, it was an overwhelming uh, success, and uh, so we hope that you will, one, be part of Fresh Wind this Friday, 6.30, Saturday, 6.30, and Sunday in the morning, and then Fam Jam in the afternoon. We're really, really excited about that. Well, the month of September, we're in a sermon series on the family. Last week, Pastor Austin kicked off the series. He set the table for this uh, by sharing a message called The Connected Family. And, and we were challenged last Sunday to participate in a 40-day digital fast where we set aside the distractions of our cell phones and other devices uh, that distract us or capture our attention away from maybe our family, away from time with God. And uh, we're capturing that time so that we can strengthen our spiritual lives. And I hope that if you uh, are participating in that just a week into this, that you see results. I'm telling you, uh, my TV hasn't been on in the morning at all. There's been no news in my, in my house in the mornings and uh, a half an hour, an hour of that is just a, is just a, you know what? I still know what's going on in the world. I do. Um, so anyway, I just being able to take time, I want to just share just a, a story. Some of you know um, our son, Elijah, who is 21. Elijah is on the autism spectrum. And uh, he was home for church last Sunday, and we went home for lunch, and 
He loves music. He loves Bob the Builder, Thomas the Train. He watches videos on sharks, on tornadoes, on the weather, on all of this kind of stuff. So we get home, and he picks up the remote and clicks on the TV, and Jeannie said, Eli, we're not watching TV. I think we both said it at the same time. And he just, like, clicked it off and threw the remote down on the TV. And he said, stupid Austin told us we can't watch TV. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's, that's how we do that. <laughs> oh, my. Just for the record, he did not tell you you can't watch TV. <laughs> oh, but I hope that we find a little bit of balance in that, and I think it's a worthwhile endeavor, even if we were able to carve out 15 or 30 minutes of extra time from ways that we're distracted and, and spend a lot of time, I think it, it, will do, it will help you dramatically. And if you haven't started on that and you want to get started, start anytime. And whatever the Lord would have you to do uh, to fulfill that, that is between you and God. So, um, so we're, um, we're defining family for this series. We're defining family more than our biological family or our nuclear or extended family. The church functions like a family. So whether you love your family or you don't, whether you are close to your family or you're not, whether you have a large family or you have no family at all, if you're part of this church, you're part of a family. This is the family of God, and we are so glad that you're a part of our family. We just want to say welcome home this morning. This morning, I want to share a message for you entitled The Committed Family. And we're going to be looking at several scriptures this morning, but I want you to turn in your Bibles with me to Deuteronomy chapter 6. And I anticipated that kind of a response because we love the Word of God and we celebrate that. So as you turn with me to Deuteronomy 6, that is in the Old Testament, about five books in. This is a familiar passage of scripture, but a scripture where I, I just... I feel like the Lord led me to uh, this morning to kind of be the foundation to talk about commitment and the committed family. I'm going to start with verse 4 of Deuteronomy chapter 6, reading from the New Living Translation. Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you are at home and when you are on the road and when you are going to bed and when you are getting up. Tie them on your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. The Lord your God will soon bring you into the land he swore to give you when he made a vow to your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It is a land with large, prosperous cities that you did not build. The houses will be richly stocked with goods that you did not produce. You will draw from water from cisterns that you did not dig. And you will eat from vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant. When you have eaten your fill in this land, be careful not to forget the Lord who rescued you from slavery in the land of Egypt. You must fear the Lord your God and serve him only. Father, this morning we pray that you, God, would speak to our hearts. Challenge us, challenge us up, God, to a, a new place with you. Lord, I pray that you would speak to our hearts, that you would convict us for things that need to change, that you would encourage us in ways that you're already speaking and doing in our lives. Affirm, God, that call on our lives to, to um, be people of your word, to be people of God in the things that we say and the things that we do and how we live and the examples that we're setting. God, I pray that you would give uh, me uh, the words to say this morning. Let them be your words and not mine. We pray your blessings on it today in Jesus' name, amen. 
So as we're talking about family, the committed family this morning, I just have a question for you. Did you know that it is costly to raise kids? (laughs) I heard very costly. You know that it's costly, but how much does it really cost? This week, I read a study that shows that the average 18-year cost for a child born to a middle-income family in 2023, you ready for it? 18 years, $375,000. How many of you believe that? Does that seem high? It seems a little drastic. That is $21,000 a year. I remember when I made a third of that for a year of income in ministry. I can't do that anymore because I've raised five kids. If you cut that in half, that's still $10,500 a year. Paying for expenses like the delivery and baby gear and a nursery setup, daycare, preschool, cribs, car seats, diapers, formula. That's going to keep you from wanting to have children. As they grow, expenses for groceries, housing, education, clothing, health care, additional costs like extracurriculars, sports teams, music lessons, tutoring, insurance, summer camps, and then you've got spending money. It takes a lot, and it's costly to raise kids today. But did you know that it is even more costly to follow Jesus? Okay, you laughed last time. <laughs> this time, silence. Silence. I think I'm touching the right buttons. It is costly to follow Jesus. According to Jesus' own words in Matthew chapter 10, it will cost you everything. Matthew chapter 10, verse 37 to 39, Jesus' words. He said this, if you love your father or mother more than you love me, you are not worthy of being mine. Or if you love your son or daughter more than me, You are not worthy of being mine. If you refuse to take up your cross and follow me, you are not worthy of being mine. If you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find it. Following Jesus costs us everything. Welcome to church. You're going, that's not the right place to start in a message if you want to keep our attention. Why don't you save that to the end? This is what it is to be a Christian. It's not a popular message in our world today, and it may not be a popular message in the room here today. But to be committed to Jesus and to be committed to raising our kids is a costly endeavor, but a price that I can tell you is worth it. It is worth it. Here is a simple formula for success in your family. Put God first. Thank you for that one and a half amen. (laughs) Put God first in what you teach your children. Put God first in how you live your life. Put him first in everything that you do. That takes commitment. The committed family is a faithful family, a consistent, devoted, loyal, reliable, dependable, surrendered, submitted family. It takes commitment. I want to encourage you this week to look up any references that you can in the Bible on the words commit or committed or commitment. If you've got the big, strong, exhaustive concordance, go open it up and look at it or do your Google search, whatever you want to. I will promise you something that you will not see when you look up the word commitment. You might be surprised that you don't find this, that nowhere in the Bible does it teach that you should put your family first. And you're saying, wait, I thought this was a place to raise a family. I thought New Hope was a great place to raise a family. I thought that if I went to church on a regular basis, it would help strengthen my marriage. I thought that if I, family's not first, this is a great place to raise a family. I believe that New Hope is a great place to strengthen your family and your marriage, but not if your commitment is first to your family. 
God is the creator, the designer of our lives, of our marriages, of our families. His way is not just a way among others. His way is the best way. Jesus himself is the way, the truth, and the life. You'll only have the kind of family and marriage that you desire if your commitment is to God first above everything else. Proverbs 16.3 says, commit your actions or commit your ways to the Lord and your plans will succeed. You see, God knows that whoever I'm committed to, whoever I'm committed to, determines who sets the rules in my life. So if my commitment is to my family first and someone in my family isn't happy, then I've got to figure out a way to make them so. And I'm gonna do what I think is right rather than obey what God says. If we put our families first, then the closest that God can ever be is second place in our lives. But when we put God first, what we're saying is, God, you set the rules for how I should treat my family. You set the rules for my family and my family benefits Let me just remind us, what does scripture have to say about the family and maybe some of the guidelines or the rules of how the family operates when we put God first? When we put God first and he sets the rules, then we look to the rule book to find out what do we do? Husbands, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. In the same way, you husbands must give honor to your wives. Treat your wife with understanding as you live together. She may be weaker than you are, but she is your equal partner in God's gift of new life. Treat her as you you should so your prayers will not be hindered. You mean if I'm not treating my wife properly, then God's not hearing my prayers. That's what scripture says. I would encourage you, go back about three years ago. Pastor Luke preached an incredible message on this chapter 1 Peter chapter 3, a different way to love. I I pulled it up and listened to part of it last night. Incredible message. Husbands, husbands and wives. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 33. I'm reading from the Amplified Version. And it says this, However, each man among you, without exception, is to love his wife as his very own self, with behavior worthy of respect and esteem, always seeking the best for her with an attitude of loving kindness. That kind of seems like you're putting her ahead of yourself. Man, that is such a key to living and loving the way Jesus taught us to. And the wife must see to it that she respects and delights in her husband, that she notices him and prefers him and treats him with loving concern, treasuring him, honoring him, and holding him dear. Listen, it's not one person has this job and the other person has. We've got this idea. Husbands rule over their wives and wives have to say, oh, yes, master. It doesn't work that way. Peter said, you are equals together in this gift of life. We work together and we do that by honoring each other, putting the other ahead of yourself. Who can bow the lowest and who can show the most honor? That's the rules that God gave us if we put in him first. Children, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1 to 3. Children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord. For this is the right thing to do. Children, obey your parents. It's the right thing to do. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. If you honor your father and mother, things will go well for you. And you will have a long life on the earth. You know, I grew up in church. And I had parents that disciplined me. They're watching right now. (laughs) They disciplined me. I'm not telling you how to discipline your kids. But it was it was it was pretty strict. My dad, I think today I'm probably seven or eight inches taller than my dad. He is shrinking by the day, I think. My dad, I'm not afraid of my dad, but I had a fear of what he could do. What he could 
discipline me with, what he could take away, what he could do to me. And there is no way, even to this day, I know I can take him finally. <laughs> but I'm not gonna, because I love my dad. Somewhere, somehow, some way, I figured this out, that if I just do what my parents say, that's gonna be the best plan. I remember asking my mom when I was a junior or senior in high school and my friends were all grounded and couldn't do things. I'm saying, and they had curfews. They had to be in by a certain time. I, I remember going to my mom and saying, Mom, why don't I have a curfew? And she said, because I trust you. I know who you're with. I know where you're going. You always tell me. And whenever you go somewhere, if the plans change, you always call me. And I didn't have one of these. Sometimes it took a dime. Boy, that's aging me a little bit. But something, some way, somehow I figured this out. If I just do what they say, it'll go well with me. And I'm here to say that scripture can be put to good use and it will go well with you and you will live a long life on the earth. Fathers, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. All of these instructions, these commands are from the Lord. And if we are committed to pleasing God above all else, and if we don't want to or we don't feel like doing them, we will because God wants us to. Jesus said these words, John 14, 15, if you love me, follow my commandments. If you love me, you'll do what I say. And if I'm totally committed to God, then I understand that when I became a Christian, a true follower of Christ, I gave my life completely to him. I am not my own. I belong fully and completely to him. This is what Paul says, 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself. For God bought you with a high price with the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. So you must honor God with your body. He said this in Galatians to the Galatians, chapter two, verse 20. I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me and the life I live in this body, I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. As a Christ follower, we should be totally committed to him. I don't possess anything. I don't possess my home. I don't possess my car. I don't possess my things, my stuff. My wife, Jeannie, I don't own her. I don't own my children. All of those things that I named off, they all belong to God. Because I belong to God. I gave him everything. I just handed it over to him and said, listen, I'm following the rules that you gave me to live by. And I'm choosing you. And I'm going to live your way. And I'm going to live this way. And so everything that I have, God, is yours. But this is what he says. Hey, Jeff, I'm going to give this stuff back to you. And you're going to be the steward of my things. You're going to be the manager of my daughter, Jeannie, and the home that I enabled you to, to live in, and the stuff that you possess, and I need you to manage this stuff really, really well. It's the same idea when we do a child dedication, and that's coming up here in another few weeks. It's a parent saying, listen, this child, we help produce this child, but this child is a gift from God. We don't really know how to make kids. We can't do this. This is a gift from God. And when we are dedicating our children to God, we're saying, I understand that this child, God, is yours. And in dedication, we say, we're giving this child back to God. And in effect, he's saying, listen, and I give this child back to you to be the manager of their lives. I need you to set a good example. I need you to say the right words. I need you to not do certain things and do other things and do them really well. You be the manager because these, this little precious child is so impressionable. They're going to watch everything that you do. They're going to listen to everything that you say. 
And if you are a parent or a grandparent or you're a Sunday school teacher or a small group leader or you're part of this family, listen, my kids have all been raised in this church. My oldest just turned four when we moved here, Pastor Zach. They've all been raised here. You guys are their aunts and uncles, grandparents, those types of people. They watch you. And there are kids around here watching you. We're part of a family, and it's important that we realize that it all belongs to God, and he's going to hold us accountable for what we do, how we treat people, how we discipline our kids. But this is just our part of the commitment. What is God's part? Glad you asked. Psalm 37, verse 5 and 6, commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust him, and he will help you. He will make your innocence radiate like the dawn. Your righteousness will shine like the dawn. The justice of your cause will shine like the noonday sun. In other words, you put God first and he puts you first. James chapter 4 verse 10, humble yourselves before the Lord and what will he do? Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. I thought that God helps those who help themselves. That is not in the Bible. Erase it from your brain. (laughs) God helps those who honor him and put him first in their lives. We just read about that. We all want what's best for our families, for our kids, whether we're follower of Jesus or not. We desire for them to have the best opportunities, the best education, to marry well, to raise great children. That would be our grandchildren. And if it's within our power, we will help them and do whatever we can to help them to succeed. If it's within our power. But we've got to be careful because we will teach our children to rely on their own power. There's a story of a a little boy who was trying to pick up a stone that was much too big for him to pick up. How many of you have watched your kids struggle to do something? And they will say, I can do it myself. (laughs) Ever seen that before? And and as parents were looking at that going, oh, no, you're not. (laughs) You're not. But they will struggle and they will try. And so this little boy was trying to pick up the stone and it was obviously too big. And he was grunting and huffing trying to pick up this rock. And his dad said, are you using all of your strength? And he said, I am, I am a giant. And he said, no, you're not. You've not asked me for my help. You see, all of my strength isn't just me. It's the God who helps me. Deuteronomy chapter six, God's telling us to teach our kids to look to him for wisdom, for direction, to look to him for help, to follow his commands, to teach them these things so they will, they will remember that God helped you in the past and they will learn to trust him in their own lives. If we make it part of our lives to remember, we need to do a much better job of remembering what God has done for us. It's what I love about Sunday nights. We've been hearing a lot of testimonies. People are sharing testimonies. We need to tell the stories what God is doing. It is incredible to build our faith. Tell the stories. That telling those stories of what God has done, remembering what he has done for us, um, we're going to be more inclined to look to him for help when, when we encounter things in the future and our, when we're teaching our kids to trust in God. We're establishing those patterns so that they'll be more inclined to look to God for help when difficult times come, and we know that they will. This mindset should become second nature for us. I know I can't do it, but God can do anything. I need his help, and I'm living in such a way that he's first in my life, and if I run into a thing that I can't do on my own, there's some things that we can do on our own, but he wants us to trust and rely on him for anything that we need. We need to fight for our families, and we need to teach our kids and model for our kids to do the same thing. We've got to set the example for them to follow. We need to be as consumed for this than we are a lot of other things in our life that we find ourselves consumed with. We need to tell the stories. I can tell you the story of the night that my grandfather got saved because he told me the story over and over and over. Why, why is that important? Man, 
It just helps build faith. Here's what my grandpa told me. He went to a, a tent revival because his wife, my grandmother, got saved before, and he said, I need what you have. And he went with her to that revival. And at the time, my grandpa was smoking two or three packs of cigarettes a day. He started when he was eight years old working in the coal mines in Arkansas. I know this because he told me over and over and over again. And he said that night when he got saved, he walked out of the tent in the dark of the night, in the dark of the field. He took those two packs of cigarettes that were on himself, and he said, I guess I won't be needing these anymore. And he threw them out in the field, never smoked another cigarette in his life. No one told him not to, to do that. No one told him not to smoke. No one told him to throw. He just said, I know I'm not going to need these anymore. And that's his testimony. Guess who never smoked in his life? Probably because of that story. Because I saw the power of God to change my grandpa. Joshua said these words, if you refuse to serve the Lord, then choose today whom you will serve. Because uh, the prophet Bob Dylan said, you're going to serve somebody. <laughs> right? It's true. If you're not serving somebody else, you're serving yourself. Joshua said, choose today whom you will serve. But as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. And I challenge you to take up that, that motto. As for me and my house, for me and my family, we're going to serve the Lord. What does it look like for us to serve God and to put him first? Man, I'm out of time. Can I just run through a couple things with you? Be in church. I know I'm talking to the choir today. But be in church. Be consistent. Be a regular attender. But not by the standards of our day. Because a regular attender only attends one and a half times a month. And if you were to beat that, you would be attending two times a month. That's 24 times in a year. I remember a day when people were committed to church. If you missed four Sundays in a year, that would have been a little bit of a stretch. And then for the next generation, maybe, maybe we were there 40 Sundays. But I'm saying if you're only there half the time, 26, 30 Sundays, and that's just a Sunday morning service, I'm talking about Sunday evenings and Wednesdays. Listen, traveling sports teams, community sports leagues, they have their games on Sundays. It stinks. What do you think is going to have the most benefit in the long run for your family? I'm not trying to condemn anything, anyone, but we have to make these decisions because it's right in front of us. What are the odds, what are the chances that your kid's going to become a Division I athlete in college? You know, if they're that good, they'll rise to the ranks anyway. Sometimes we have to make those tough decisions. Hear my heart in this. It ought to be a priority. Discipleship. Listen, I'm thankful that this church believes in discipleship, but discipleship happens at home too. Discipleship happens with your friends. We're not called to just be saved. We're called to make disciples. Pastor Weaver told me, if you have not seen the movie Forged, I have not seen it. But the way he was describing it, I need to see it today or tomorrow. How many of you have seen the movie? About discipling people. I would encourage you on his recommendation to check it out. Sunday school, Sunday nights, Wednesday nights, classes. Listen, reading our Bible, that's what a committed family does. This is God's word, and if I put him first, then I need to know what he says. What does he say about this thing? What is he, what is he saying to me? Memorizing God's word. Deuteronomy 6 said, keep these words in your heart. Psalm, the psalmist said in 119.11, your word I've hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Listen, you know, to think that we would never have the word of God seems like a far stretch, but we never thought we would be confined to our homes at any point in our lives either. And we might say that'll never happen again, but guess what? We have no idea what the future holds, but there are countries right now in this world, about 50 of them, that this book is not 
available to purchase, to own, to have. Could it happen in America? I, I pray that it doesn't. But listen, if we, if we have every book taken away, we better, we better know some of it. Put it to memory. All right, I'm off my kick. But what if we applied the same expectations to other things like our church attendance? What if your car only started one out of every three times that you turned the key? How long would you have that car? What if your refrigerator stopped working for a day or two every now and then? Do you just say, oh, well, it works most of the time? If your water heater gave you an icy cold shower a couple times a week, do you just put up with the, with the water heater? If God is first in your life, missing should be the exception. Church is important. Let me just end with this. I, I, I'm talking about us being an example. David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let's go to the house of the Lord. I hope this morning you were encouraged saying, listen, I can't wait to go and see who's preaching and see what we can do to worship and see how I can respond and how I can grow and what commitments I can make because I want to know Jesus more. I want to grow deeper in my relationship with him. It's important that we understand the impact that we have on people around us, parents, grandparents on our children. It's a story that I heard Jensen Franklin share about a famous attorney from Chicago. This attorney had an alcohol problem, and every day on his way to his law practice, he would walk past a bar. And as his regular routine was to slip into that bar for a morning drink, and then he would go on to his office. He did this nearly every day. The worship team can come. One day as he was walking, the snow in Chicago was gently falling to the point where the snow was starting to accumulate on the sidewalk. Just as he was about to enter the bar as his normal routine was, he, a familiar sound caught his attention. He turned around and he saw his little six-year-old boy. Somehow, he had slipped out of the house away from his mom without her knowing the boy had been following his dad in his footsteps on the snow. A little six-year-old boy in his little feet walking in the steps of his dad. And as he turned and he saw his little six-year-old boy and where he was standing, he turned and he scooped up his boy and he took him home. And he put his little boy in the hands of his mom and he went downstairs in his home and fell to his knees and began to weep and cry out loud and he said oh God help me to never ever again allow my footsteps to lead my children to a bar and at that point he never took a drink again but let my footsteps lead my children to you from this day forward Who's walking in your steps? Who's following you? Mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, Sunday school teacher, small group leader, anyone, everyone in the room? I will tell you this, you have no idea who is watching you and who is following your lead. And the question that I leave you this morning is where are your footprints leading? Where are your footprints leading? Not only you, bow your heads close your eyes with me life is tough there's a whole lot of other things that I want to say this morning and a whole lot of things that obviously weren't necessary but life is getting tough and it's tougher every day it's challenging when we have to make a decision about whether we're going to church or not I would just throw this out. If your kids have to ask you, are we going to church this morning? Your footprints probably aren't leading directly. But when we have to make those tough decisions because there's so many other things that we can do. Let our life speak in the name of Jesus.
morning, I, I want to just challenge you with this. I realize we're running low on time. But I just want to ask you this morning, if you're taking a step up in your commitment as a follower of Jesus to put him first in everything, maybe he's there and he's always been there for you. That's great. Maybe there's areas of your life where he's not first. I encourage you to listen to the Holy Spirit and be obedient. We're not perfect people, but we have a perfect God. We're not the strongest people, but we have a strong, strong God. And with him, we can do anything. This morning, we're going to sing this song, I Speak Jesus, one more time. And I don't want you to stand unless you mean it this morning. You're saying, I'm taking a look at everything. And I'm going to listen to the Holy Spirit in everything. I'm going to sit down my phone, I'm going to sit down my device, I'm going to spend some time with God, and I'm going to let Him speak to me and challenge me to do the right things, to put Him first, to follow His plan, His purposes, His will for my life, for my family for those around me, that I'm going to be an example of what God can do in a life. And I'm saying He's calling me up and I'm making a new commitment in my walk with Jesus and in my family. I want to be committed and I want to be known as someone who trusts Jesus for everything. So we're going to start to sing this song. If you really truly mean it, I'm just going to ask you to stand and then I'm going to lead you in prayer.